Welcome to the 18th episode of the sixth season of the Ubuntu podcast. In this episode, we're going to interview Linda Sandvik about Code Club. We've also got another time saving tip in the form of a gooey love, and we're going to read your feedback. If you're listening live, you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I'm Tony, and joining me this evening are a triumvirate of geeks looking at me confusedly. First up is Alan. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm fine, thank you very much. Excellent. And Mark is here as well. Hello. And so is Laura. Hiya. Excellent. Laura. Yes. What, uh, have you been doing anything interesting in the last couple of weeks you might like to share with us? I backed my first Kickstarter project. Ooh. Did you really? I did. What did you back? The Shore Ditch Village Hall Kickstarter. Ah, yes, I saw that. And you don't live anywhere near Shoreditch? No. So originally I just backed it with one pound which is the minimum so i could then justify tweeting it to other people because uh, yeah i don't live in london but I you, went, couldn't, you couldn't tweet it without paying a pound no it just seemed a bit um right yeah. right yeah so um yeah but i actually went to the monkey gra conference which the company organized right and i figure that next year it's probably going to be there in which case if i go to it i will make use of the facilities right. so, so then i <laughs> so then i backed it with 25 pounds and what do you which get for means that? my name is now on the awesome wall oh i will be on the awesome wall isn't that the thing that jeremy clarkson does? no no okay. no <laughs> that's the cool is this wall inside this awesome building that, that in shows the cafe all the people Oh, that's a really cool idea. I think so, too. The ego mm. wall, as yes. you should call it. No, it's the awesome wall. You're, you're not um, a stranger to having your name in print after giving someone money, are you? No, Richard Herring. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, you said, there was something familiar about it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I get my name in the programme. Cool. cool. Excellent. Alan? Um, I received two Kickstarter things Ooh. This, Ooh. this month. Uh, one was uh, that piece of metalwork over there, which is now my wallet. Okay. And the other one is an Ouya. It's a what? Uh, it's a games machine, Tony. A game. Okay, yeah. It's a thing you play. It's fun. Ah, yes. yes. Fun. Remember that? Fun. Employing <laughs> time in a, in a profitless yes. and nonsensical <laughs> manner. It's, it's, it's basically an Android um, games console thing with yes. a couple of controllers. What's you know? the wallet thing? Uh, that. It's a it's a metal wallet for holding um, Alan points cards. I'll hold it close to the microphone. <laughs> That's better. Um, it's a metal Sounds thing. Great. So rather than having a big bloke, because as a bloke, I usually have a wallet in my pocket, and it's a giant bulky thing. Right. And this thing is a little metal thing, and it holds all your cards together really. What if you nice have cash tightly. as well? Um, you can't you put, put it in cash in it. You don't put cash in it. Okay. So you have to hold them separately. Royalty, yeah, Mark, yeah. I don't carry cash. Right. Okay. As it's metal, does it stop RFID chips? Yes, it does. Ah, so you can't get through the barriers on the underground with it? Well, you take your card out. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm, it's pretty much like hard work. Yeah. Well, you could do what that guy did who dropped his uh, oyster card in acetone. Oh, yes. Dissolve um, it away. Yeah, yes. that would be good. Mm, Turn it into a wand, if I remember correctly. Yes, that was the idea. <laughs> what about you, Mark? I Well, I, I also got a Kickstarter. I got my, uh, my Rhino Shield for my phone. To yeah. stop it, so if I drop it on concrete, uh, the glass won't break on the back. Um, Prove it. <laughs> and I also went to Download Festival. Ah, yes, yes. I, How was the pop festival? Uh, it was. It was a, a rock and metal festival. Okay. I should probably uh, clarify that nothing right. to do with downloading really. Oh, okay. That's just a cool name. Um, but these are that sign as yes, well. Yes, I saw Iron Maiden and Ramstein and Slipknot and uh, other such. Metally uh, beat combos. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Those. And it was I'm very sorry, good. Mark. It was very good. <laughs> Excellent. And you caught the sun a little bit. Uh, yes. As I said, it um, took some chasing down, but yeah. I got it eventually. Hasn't, it hasn't gone net. down much since the last episode. I mean, that's one. Wow. He's had that for two weeks. Yeah. Uh, yes. Wow. Presumably. Oh, man. Yeah. Yes. You've been varnished that's every right. day. <laughs> Wow, it sounds like we've had a productive couple of weeks. What have you been doing, Tony? Oh, nothing of any interest whatsoever. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Let's get on with the show. <laughs> Joining us on the line is Linda Sandvik from Code Club. Hello, Linda. Hi. How are you doing this evening? Uh, pretty good, actually. Excellent. Well, thank you for coming on uh, the show to talk to us. Tell us, what is Code Club? Uh, so Code Club is uh, basically an after-school coding club. And 
for children aged 9 to 11, and we send professional programmers as volunteers uh, into the schools or um, libraries or other venues, and uh, they take lessons that we made and then teach uh, the children how to program, because the government isn't. That's awesome. How, how did it get started? Um, well, it, we just started um, in April last year. Uh, there was a lot of talk in the media about how um, ITC curriculum in this uh, country was rubbish, and uh, in fact, they, they scrapped the ICT curriculum entirely, and um, of course, Eric Schmidt uh, accused uh, the UK of uh, throwing away its digital heritage uh, by not teaching computing. And uh, yeah, a friend, uh, Claire Sutcliffe and I were at a pub and we just decided that we could do something about this. Excellent. All the best decisions are made in pubs. (laughs) (laughs) So how did you get started? Um, Well, (laughs) uh, we we got some friends together and we started writing a few lessons. Um, I'd read some, uh, you know, sort of introduction introduction to computer science programming books that were really boring and mm-hmm. I know that it can be really really exciting and fun that's why I do it uh, so that was like our focus from the very beginning that it should be fun uh, we wrote some lessons together we took them into 20 pilot schools and then we did a, did a lot of user testing with the kids um, because we Claire and I both kind of come from the web world where we're used to doing um, you know user testing and, and iteration um, we we kind of just uh, used the same model for for writing the lessons. Mm-hmm. Cool. So, what do your lessons teach? What, what's uh, covered? Well, we start off with Scratch. So, mm-hmm. Scratch is this amazing uh, programming uh, ID language um, that was developed at MIT uh, Media Lab at the Lifelong Kindergarten Group, uh, specifically for teaching children how to program. And it's really nice and visual and uh, you can uh, drag blocks of code together and they fit together like a puzzle. Uh, you don't have to type anything, so it takes the whole syntax issue out of it. You don't get any nasty errors thrown in your face, um, error messages and such. So it, it's really nice. Um, and, yeah, we just mostly it's uh, making games. Uh, <laughs> Uh, all all the all the kids that we talk to love playing games, and uh, we, as we've discovered, most of them actually uh, love making them as well. So I expect that um, in in the course of some of your lessons, you get a kid doing something you didn't expect. What's the coolest thing that you've seen someone in one of the lessons do? Oh, they're just so creative. Um, a scratch makes it really easy to to adapt. Uh, and make the game your own and change the different bits. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's incredible to, to see, even though everyone starts off with the same instructions, they all have like completely different games by the end of the session, which is amazing. Uh, but I think the best moment for me in a code club was when um, one, one of the kids asked the volunteer, so this program, Scratch, is that also done with programming ah. and it's just like yes <laughs> it gets that's the bit that's when they really get it isn't it when you when you realize they can actually create i have a vested interest i have a nine-year-old daughter and um she's had a play with scratch and i've put her in front of it and she's she's got a book and I, but i would love i'd love for her to um get involved with a club with other children you know people of her same age and and have some more structure to it so how how did you go about getting um into schools how how did you approach them and and how did they respond uh well basically we we tell the volunteer so we have a sign up on our on our website where schools can sign up and we try to find a volunteer for them or if a which is more often the case, a volunteer wants to do it, and we just tell them to uh, contact the nearest school. We have the materials that they can present, and um, yeah, mo- most schools are, are very open to it. Uh, they, they love it, obviously, because it's free, and uh, they feel like they should be doing something <laughs> uh, with this computing thing that's been all over the media. Like, we didn't create the bus. The bus was already there. Um do you use the, so the infrastructure that the schools already have, their own computers, or do you bring them along? Yeah, how, how, all, how do you the, all the primary schools have computers. Um, 
Not all of them have internet, but it's okay. Uh-huh. Wow. We'll make do without. <laughs> so what what do you do then if um if a school's just got, you know, a bunch of old computers not connected to the internet with a stock image, I, I assume most of them will be running Windows. How do you get them up and running with a Scratch environment? Uh, you know, put Scratch on a USB stick and mm-hmm. take it into the school. Um, it's not. It hasn't been as difficult as I thought it would be. Great. So, why is it so important to teach children these skills? Um, it's kind of. It's it's kind of like when we when we teach um, children how to read, we also teach them how to write, and we're teaching them how to use all the sort of software and applications but not how it's made. And, um, well, it seems very obvious to me, at least, that the people who know how computers work are going to be um, very much an advantage over the people who don't. Mm. Like, they're going to have just, like, a better idea of how to solve uh, problems. Uh, Like, computers run our world, like, increasingly so, more and more every day, right? So. Uh, if you have an idea of how they work, you don't necessarily have to become a programmer. That's not what we want. But if you if you know how they work and what they can do and how they can make your life easier, um, you're gonna you're gonna have a lot. Uh, uh, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna have a lot better uh, time. Um, okay, so solving problems. So Code Club focuses on children aged nine to eleven. Why that age range? Uh, we had to start somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair answer. So, I mean, we were two people. Uh, we had to start somewhere, and uh, we figured at nine they already have um, the reading skills and the uh, like, the numeracy skills. They they know basic uh, logic, hmm. so we wouldn't have to teach them that. Um, actually, some some people are using or materials with younger kids and it's going fine it just takes a little bit more time like they maybe can't finish each lesson in just one hour but um and and some of the kids you know they require help with just reading the instructions right how how long so you say it's like an hour session and it's after school how how many sessions in um you know a course and uh and what's the outcome at the end of that uh so we have uh, a term a school term is like eight to ten weeks it varies a bit um so we have uh, a lesson every week uh for you know as long as <laughs> we're, we're keeping one term ahead uh, of the schools that started so um the the first schools that started um in in May uh, last last year, um, they've been doing it for a year, and we just keep producing materials. <laughs> so that they can just one page ahead of them, are you? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And so once once they've learnt and um, got through making a simple game in Scratch, is there? Do you do you migrate them onto something else, or do you think Scratch uh, yes, Scratch absolutely. is enough? Uh, no, Scratch is not enough. It's a nice gentle start. Um, but after that, we go on to teaching how to make websites. Oh. Um, so I think HTML is a very gentle introduction to writing your own commands because <laughs> browsers are very forgiving. Yeah. Um, but then from, from HTML, we move on to Python, which is exciting. We can do some proper programming. Is that still uh, making also, websites with Python? or do you do- uh, No, no, making making things, making games mostly mm-hmm. um not necessarily websites there there's more than websites <laughs> and and so when you're using something like python obviously it's quite a leap to go from uh, dragging and dropping lumps of um code in in um in something like scratch to you know, bashing the keyboard and, and typing in you know commands and yeah you know, python's fairly straightforward but um, is that is that quite a quite a leap for the children, or do you find they they actually pick it up pretty easily? Uh, yeah, they they are so amazing. They um, so we're just testing uh, some Python app now. We haven't rolled it out to all the schools yet, but um, they they just 
take to it. Um, I think Python is a is a really good first language to learn, and it seems that the kids are just yeah they they somehow get it. I've tried to teach JavaScript before, and it had not had uh, the same results with that. <laughs> So I don't know if it's the Python or if it's we have more experience now, but um, yeah, they they really seem to love it. And uh, we also just started sending out uh, all the Raspberry Pis that uh, Google and Raspberry Pi have given us oh, um, to oh, all wow. the code clubs. They gave you some. Uh, yeah, four thousand of them. Wow. wow, I didn't know there were four thousand of them. <laughs> <laughs> Oh wow! Uh, so, so, so do you send them out with like pre-installed like SD card with all your stuff on it or something? Uh, yeah, and uh, then then they have fun. Um, it comes with uh, I think it's Debian yeah. version of Debian on on, and they get to you know uh, do some uh, proper proper computing. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So you started Co Club uh, a year ago in May, so it's just over a year old now. How's it grown since you started? Oh uh, well, uh, when we first started it, we thought that we'd have like maybe five schools, maybe twenty by the end of the year, and uh, we have like eight hundred and sixty something now. <laughs> wow, <laughs> it's amazing. That's pretty big. So is yeah, that? Yeah, the two of you must be very busy. It's <laughs> <laughs> a lot of travel. Yeah, we have we have hired um, a couple of more people. So, do you have like one volunteer teaching in each school, or do you have like several like one volunteer covering doing code clubs in several different places? How does it sort of compare? Uh, it really depends. Uh, some schools um, have you know they have the, their one volunteer. Uh, yeah. Other people who can't do it every week, which I understand, it's hmm. quite a big commitment. They go together. And there'd be like two or three people um, doing it, uh, like doing one code club together, but they, you know, take turn. Yeah. Um, and then other schools, like the ICT teacher or the person who, it's not necessarily an ICT teacher, but they are the ones who know how the printer works. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they will they will run one. Right. Um, so we actually have quite a few teachers running it in school time, which is. Cool. A bit terrifying, really. Yeah. So, do they? I mean, what level of um, of programming knowledge do they need? Is it does it does it just need someone who can teach from a worksheet, or does some, do they actually have to know um, the programming principles that underlie it all? Yeah, I think they do. I think, and if they know uh, a curly brace language of some kind, hmm. then they're good to go. <laughs> I like um, that definition. That's good. <laughs> I like that. I'm going to use it. And Code Club's gone global this week officially. Ah, uh, yeah, last week, uh, I think. Uh, <laughs> it's all kind of blurred. Cause it was <laughs> um, uh, yeah, we just, uh, you know, we put all our lessons up on GitHub, mm-hmm. uh, hoping that people will uh, take them and add to them and uh, so we can uh, improve. And uh, also people have been translating them into lots of different languages, which is amazing to see. Wow. Wow. And yeah, we had our first code club start in India last week. Wow, cool! Brilliant. So that's exciting. Um, yeah, hopefully everyone can can learn to program. So, so on that subject, how, how do people find out more? How do people um, you know get involved, or if they want to get in touch with their local school, where should they find out more about the code clubs? Uh, so we're at Code Club on Twitter as well as at Code Club World. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're Code Club on, on GitHub, and our website is codeclub.org.uk and codeclubworld.org. Fantastic. Well, I certainly am going to take a look at this myself, but um, <laughs> I wish you all the best. And uh, thanks very much for coming on to talk to us, Linda. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks very much. Bye. 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 And now it's time for some gooey love. Mm. Super. <laughs> Special. And this week's gooey love is GP Rename. What's, What's that it then? do, Tony? 
It's a batch renamer for files. Ooh, that sounds exciting. It is. You point it at a directory of files and you can give it some parameters. It's a GUI program, so you've not got to worry about um, you know, command line options and stuff. You just say, look in this directory, it'll show you the files. And you can say how you want to change them. So you can change the case of the files. So useful if you've got a load of uppercase files you want to lowercase or vice versa. You can insert or delete little bits based on you know, a regular expression almost. So you, if you've got the same characters in each of the files, you can get rid of those. Replace or remove things or do numerical um, file renaming as well. So I find it really useful when I'm doing uh, for, uh, a bunch of photographs for a client Funny that. Yeah. Well, because the camera spits out, you know, yeah, uh, BA63Q5779 uh, you know, for the next 7,000 images or something, you know, each with an incremental file name in it. And I might only pick four or 500 of those to give to somebody um, from 2,000 images. So I want to put them all in a directory and then rename them numerically to whatever the client's name is, 1.jpg, jpeg and all the way through. So it huh. makes it nice and consistent for them. Huh. And doesn't show how many bad photos I had to take out. Oh, that's <laughs> a good point. Yeah. <laughs> so don't look at it and go, well, where's 3399? I've got 3398 and 3... Right. You know. You're, yes, yeah. I see. So, yeah, you're really useful for that. Um, and, yeah, batch, batch renaming of files. Cool. cool. Quite cool. Cool. Yeah. And um, that's it for a gooey love this week, really, I think. Yes. <laughs> we have your feedback uh, Jim Mulheron emailed us to say I enjoyed hearing about Mark Johnson's newly updated system with the AMD APU. I hope from time to time Mark can be encouraged to explain what he's discovering as he progresses with it I put together a new box with AMD APU as well I hope to get back working on it until I migrate my stuff from a legacy system as of now it dual boots Kubuntu 1210 soon to be 1304 and Windows 7 <laughs> Yes, and I think George Castro said something similar as well. He'd like to know more about your AMD APU system, Mark. So mm. speak on. Uh, well, essentially, running it is like running a system with a 3D accelerated graphics card plugged into it, except it's all on one chip. So you just oh, install the like drivers. And Intel with a Sandy Bridge with the GPU on board kind of thing. Yes, except it's AMD. Okay. So it's, it's, a, a, it's, a, it's essentially an ATI graphics card. So does it make no difference to the end user experience at all? Well, it's it's uh, an improved end user experience over my previous graphics card. Sure, but uh, it doesn't. You still plug a cable into the back of the computer. It yeah, so I've got monitor. now I've got I've got two two outputs on my motherboard rather than having two outputs on my graphics card. Right, and now I plug them into my monitors and I install the AMD drivers and magic happens. Wow! But something else which I did find out, which was really cool, um, it's a UFEI. Um, system rather than a file yes. system, and I went into the 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 GUI. In fact, that it's got. So you press delete and instead of getting a nice blue screen and like keyboard stuff. You get a nice mouse driven GUI, and in the footer, it says tomorrow's technology today. Really? <laughs> wow! <laughs> wow! I think that you'll make Super Engineer in the IRC channel very happy with that. Mention. Yes, I might. I might um, try and send you a screenshot, which we can release with the show. Awesome! That would be awesome. That's fantastic. Well, let us know how your adventures progress. I will. And uh, Mike emailed us to say, "I just finished listening to episode seven and wanted to comment on Mozilla's new browser project." The name Servo is a tribute to the television character Tom Servo in the series Mystery Science Theatre 3000. I loved the show and the character. Unfortunately, the last new episode came out 14 years ago and the show is not well known outside the US. So for most people, the name sounds painfully dull and mechanical. I assume, however, that the name Servo will be replaced if it ever gets released for mainstream use. Uh, 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 this has just clicked for me. Is this... Mystery Science Theatre 3000. I've seen people mention MST3K. Sounds about right. Ah. Yeah. I've never heard of it, but it, it, with a name like that, I wish I had. Huh. <laughs> there we go. Alan is aghast. Yes. Phil Thompson emailed us 
about installing Linux on Windows OEM pre-installed machines. Several laptops I've set up recently don't allow you to not accept Windows other than by returning the whole system to the retailer. The terms and conditions have been crafted to make Windows part of the thing that you've bought contractually and hence the option is not there to try to recover the cost of Windows. It may not have been tested in the courts yet but it was never straightforward to get a refund and the current terms seem to make it harder still. Do you know of any recent examples of people getting refunds for unused Windows OEM pre-installs? Nope. No. But if you don't want Windows and you want to save money, you could always build your own computer. It's a lot cheaper. Would you recommend an AMD APU-based system? I, in fact, I think I would. All right. Hmm. Yes. Uh, mm. What about laptops, though? No. What? Uh, yeah. <laughs> 3D print yourself a case on a rep wrap. <laughs> uh, yes, that right. sounds like a good plan. Uh, I've just got to read you this bit of awesomeness from the Mysteries Arts Theatre 3000 Wikipedia page. The series features a man and his robot sidekicks who are trapped on a space station by an evil scientist and forced to watch a selection of bad movies. <laughs> To stay sane, the man and his robots provide a running commentary on each film, making fun of the flaws and w- rise, wisecracking their way through each reel in the style of a movie theatre. Oh, I think I've seen... Yeah, they've got... You can, you're, like, looking over their shoulders, and you say, yes, I've seen that. Cool. And finally, Jezra emailed us because he feels we're inappropriate. While I enjoy listening to you, PC, there is a serious lack of thing swearing on the show. To keep the sweet, I suggest adding some expletives at random intervals. Obviously, you won't be saying or and that's okay. There are plenty of other things that you can say that won't get you in trouble with hats that base their outrage on a thousand year old invasion of England by the French. For example, you could easily say hot dog instead of yeah, hot dog. That's some fine software. Hot dog, what a great email. (laughs) (laughs) So you did that. I'm just grateful we got through that without slipping up. (laughs) (laughs) Are we going to have to give a credit to that Creative Commons buzzer sound? Yes, guitar guy, 3927. (laughs) (laughs) He already had it committed to memory. The fact that you know is... uh, Although we could use GP rename to rename him to something else. Okay. So that was a callback. Yeah, I saw that. That's the end of your feedback. The Ubuntu podcast needs you. Yes, you. If you hear something that tickles, titillates, or taunts you, tweet us at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook, and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. We really would like to hear from you. So go on, do your duty, keep calm, and compose an email. That's all for this episode. Thank you very much indeed for listening. You can join us on Wednesday the 3rd of July at 1900, sorry, 1930 UTC for our next live episode. That's half past eight in the evening for those in the UK. How do we get that time thing wrong every single time? It's numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Reading numbers, not done that. Yeah, indeed. It's confusing for me. Was that anyway. a, new, a new get in touch thing? Uh, there's lots of them. Right. Yeah. Oh, I look forward to more. Oh, I know you do. Uh, well, thank you for listening, and we'll speak to you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.